Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Day. Welcome to each and every one of you who are here with us today. Welcome to all of our guests and to all those who are listening in online now or at a later time. Welcome. Merry Christmas to you all. I almost feel like we need a, a sort of Easter saying on today. Uh, you know, at Easter time, we say, He is risen. And then the audience responds, he is risen indeed. I almost feel like we should say, he was born. And the audience should respond, he was born indeed. Let's just try that out. He was born. He was born indeed. Amen. Hallelujah. This is one of the most significant, major, just awesome times of year when we remember that God took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary over 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. Let's praise him in a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you that you have lavished your love upon us. that you sent Jesus, your son, to be born of the Virgin Mary, to live among us, teaching us about the kingdom of God, to die on the cross, to make atonement for our sin, and for the resurrection, for eternal life. Jesus, we thank you that you are alive and well, seated at the right hand of God. Father and Jesus, we thank you so much for the gift of your Holy Spirit, which you give to us. We thank you that you dwell in us like a temple and that you dwell in your church like a temple. We are so joyous to be able to celebrate together to be able to sing your praise and to be able to worship you. And now, Lord God, we come to you and we seek, as we do every week, a word from you that you might sustain our souls, that you would teach us, rebuke us, correct us, and train us in righteousness that we might be fully equipped to do your will, what is good and pleasing in your sight. Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, come. In the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. This Advent season, we have been working through the gospel once again, each time coming at the gospel from one of the themes of Advent. Today, we are going to look at the gospel through the theme of love, which is the theme for the fourth Sunday of Advent. I pray that we are encouraged by exploring the enormity of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. So let's open up to our Luke passage. We'll be starting in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. We'll simply be honing in on a few various points for our attention today. Beginning in verse 28, Gabriel here comes to Mary and says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, as soon as we see those words, the Lord is with you, in our minds, we might begin to ask, well, why is Mary so favored? Is it because Mary is more faithful than others, perhaps others of all time or others in her generation? Is it because she's more pure? Is it because she sins less than others? Is it because she made all the right sacrifices in the temple or did all of the right things in order to be favored? But if we're reading the text and if we know our biblical canon, then one of the things that we will come to is that it, this text has very little to do with Mary and everything to do with God. 
It is not about Mary's merit. It is about God who lavishes his favor in grace. And this is the way it has always been throughout all of human history. God takes the initiative and God chooses whom he favors. As he says in the book of Exodus, uh, somewhere between chapters 30 and 35, he's ta- God is talking to Moses up on the mountain, and he says, I will have mercy upon those whom I, I will have mercy. It is God's choosing that provides the favor. Why Abraham, out of all of the people of his day? Because God chose him. Why Isaac over Ishmael? Well, because Isaac was the promised child, God chose him. Why Jacob over Esau? Because God chose him. Why Judah over Joseph in the long range of Old Testament history? Because God chose Judah. Why David over Saul? Because God chose... You see the theme? God's choice. Why marry over any other virgin in the time? God could have arranged for any virgin to become betrothed to Joseph. How of the house of David. He could have made someone from the rocks. Why marry? Not because of Mary's merit, but because of God's lavish grace and favor upon her. Indeed, if you hunt through the text, you will see no other reason than God's favoring Mary. But in favoring Mary, God also favors all of humanity. Instead of wiping us out with another flood, he has chosen to send his son Jesus Christ into the world. Lavish love. There is also nothing that any human group or group of humans did to merit, deserve, or earn the grace of God that he so sent his son. You know, the Pharisees of the day, the Pharisees were a group um, in, in the early, uh, lat, much latter parts of um, uh, before Christ came, Oh, I'm just going to ballpark it here this morning. About 300 B.C. and onwards, the Pharisees grow up. And the Pharisees are a group that just long to fulfill every dot and tittle of the Word of God for one purpose, that the Messiah might come. And the Pharisees were rigorous in their performance of the law, and they wanted everybody else to be just as rigorous. If only we fulfilled the law, the Messiah would come. And what do we see in the New Testament? That there is tremendous conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees tried to fulfill the law. They tried to do good. They tried to earn the merit. And God says, none of that is what brought me. In the fullness of time, God chose Mary. He chose his people. He chose to send Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ chose to come. Greetings, O favored one. Nothing to do with her. Everything to do with God. Let's take a look and uh, more, more so onto verse 30 and 31. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be Great, and will be called Son of the Most High. 
The promise here is that Jesus will be one who is great. However, it is not a matter of any human form of greatness that he's speaking about. It's, it's not a matter of him being a, a visible king while here on earth. He will one day become the king of kings. He is in a fashion king of kings. But when he came and walked among us, he did so as a servant. He did so of someone of low status. And yet he is still great even in the midst of his low status. Why is he great? He is great because his words will shake the world. They will form people forever afterwards. They will be recorded, they will be studied, they will be taught, they will be preached. Books about the words he wrote will fill libraries all around the world from generation to generation to generation onwards. His words, his deeds shake the world. They establish once and for all that God is real and that Jesus is the Son of God. His deeds shake the foundations of the heavens and earth. Why? Because he dies on the cross to make atonement for our sin. That humans might once again be reconciled with God. Or once, I'm sorry, not once again. Just will be finally reconciled with God. With all those who have faith in his name. They'll be reconciled with God, something that could not be done otherwise. He will be great. Why? Because he will be resurrected on the third day after his death and will live on forever and ever and ever in a human body. The end time resurrection breaking into the middle of history and foretelling what will happen in the end of days. For all those who believe, resurrection, life. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. This is the second person of the Trinity. He is God's Son, made known and vindicated through the resurrection, and also made known to us by the virgin birth. And finally, the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus will reign and rule. God who became flesh and walked among us right before the cross washing the feet of his disciples, King of kings and Lord of lords forever. This is the announcement of Jesus' birth. This is, this is the, the incredible joy that we should be feeling at this announcement. This is the wonder of this announcement. This is the lavish love that we have in Jesus. And yet God's great love for humankind did not begin with just sending Jesus down at Christmas. This was something that was planned and foretold from the beginning of history. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis chapter 3, you're immediately thinking, okay, we're at the fall. This is the beginning. This is with Adam and Eve and the serpent. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The Lord is in the midst of his um, judgment upon the serpent, upon um, the tempter. And here's what we see in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. 
He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The offspring of Eve, this is one specific offspring, will crush the head of the serpent, which is Satan, but will in the process also die, because that's how serpents will attack. They strike the lowest point, infecting the person with poison. You shall bruise his heel. This is called the, the, the proto-gospel, the first initiation of the gospel from the very foundation of history, from the very beginning. We hear this good news of God's lavish love to save humanity. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. It is not just from the beginning of history that Jesus or God had this plan. It is from the very beginning of, uh, before the beginning of time. It is from before the foundation of the earth. To, to look at this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. I'm going to start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verse 4, listen in. Even as he chose us, the initiative is on God, not on us. Even as he chose us in him, that's in Christ, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now you have a result clause there, that we should be holy and blameless before him. But the, the, the preceding clause upon which that, that, that other clause is, is resolving is that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Before God made the heavens and the earth, he knew exactly what was going to be needing to happen in order to bring us to him. Do you understand that? Before all things, God knew. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us. There can be possibly no merit on our part. It is all about God's choosing. This is the sort of love that we are encountering at Christmas. This is the sort of love that we are encountering in Jesus Christ. It's a love that has lasted from before time, before creation. God's love for us. It's an infinite love. It's a powerful love. It's a zealous, jealous love of God. And we just hit these words then that were also earlier read. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. And you have to pick up some of the context from this. John is, is going to be the longest lived apostle and initial 12 disciples, right? He's, he's the longest lived of them all in the first century. He writes the book of Revelation near the end. He's writing the letters of John somewhere probably between 70 and um, 90 or 100 A.D. He's had time, about 30 or 40 years, to reflect on the saving grace of Jesus Christ and all that he's heard from Jesus. He's reflecting on this long relationship with God. And, and the, the English just often does not convey it. In the Greek, there's this sense of excitement. There's this, there's this sense of wonder described because the, some of the Greek words used here are just extraordinarily rare. They're only used in certain situations. In the ESV, it says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. A far better translation is, is, is this. See what kind of love the Father has lavished on us. We don't use that word lavish in English a whole lot, but lavish means just this extraordinary abundance being given. 
And John, after all of these years of knowing the love of God, is still excited and in wonder and awe. Wow! What Jesus has done for us. What God has done for us. And take a moment and simply think about what that he did. Look at this. See what kind of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Now, this is not about us being equal to God or becoming gods. That's total category confusion. What's happening here is that we are being invited in to have this status of being part of God's family. What wonder, what joy, what love that is. God has taken those who were far from him, who were his enemies, who do not deserve anything but the deepest wrath and judgment of God upon them because of sin. God has taken them and made them your immediate family. Oh, um, I guess I'm going to go here. I'm going to insult all of us, and I don't mean to, but bear with me. This is like a Jewish family inviting Hitler into their house and adopting him as their own child. That is what God is doing for us in Jesus Christ. He is adopting and taking unto his own those who do not deserve anything but his deepest wrath. And if we don't get that or understand it, we're missing the gospel. It's an amazing, wondrous love. It's a lavish love, an infinite love that God is giving to us. And this is not God the Father alone, but it's also Jesus Christ's love for us. You see, Jesus, being part of the Trinity, he's the second member of the Trinity, agreed with God the Father that this is what needed to be done from before the foundation of the world. He left his father's side to become human. The text in Philippians says he's emptied himself of glory. What was that like? All the love of God, all of the infinite care of God, the joy of God, the, the tremendous, almost indescribable, interpenetrating relationship between the Trinity, which, which was full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and everything that one could ever want, going on from eternity in perfection. And he gives all of that up. To come and be born in a stable. And to live among us. To then die for us. And rise again and say, hey, all of you, come unto me. And I will give you rest and salvation and redemption. And I will make you one of my own. Oh, the love of Jesus Christ. It's such a love that Paul in the book of Ephesians just says this. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Paul is also overwhelmed with the love of God. And he's going to tell us two things in this passage that I'm going to read. Number one, he's going to tell us that we absolutely must have the power of God in us to begin to comprehend the love of God. And then he's going to say that the love of God is incomprehensible. We got we to gotta have the power of God at work within us, see, even understand, and we'll never get there because it surpasses all knowledge. Listen to this. 
For this reason, I, would bow, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's you got to have God's help. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You got to have help that Jesus Christ dwells in your heart through faith. And as he dwells in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So what's our practical application? First, to any who do not believe, now is the time to repent of sin and receive the grace found in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His love surpasses all understanding. Life from him is true life, now and forever. Receive him as Lord and Savior. Be born again. Commit in faith to Jesus now and forever. Seek his throne. For he is good and gracious and loving and merciful. Second, for all those who believe, the love found in Jesus Christ should encourage us, strengthen us, and move us toward becoming more like him. The challenge in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, is this, that everyone who hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This means that in our relationship with God, as we meditate on the love God has for us in Jesus Christ, that we desire to destroy the sins of the flesh dwelling in us. The only way we can do that is to abide in the vine. John 15. The motivation to dwell with him, to read and study your Bible, to pray, to fast, to celebrate in Christ, to do all those things with him is primarily God's love. When we lack a strong life with God, it is usually because we are not thinking about God's love for us in Christ and because we simply don't love God as much as we should. Yet even in this, we can rest in the love of God for we have a great high priest in Jesus who understands our weaknesses and intercedes on our behalf. Beloved in Christ, dwell in in the magnificent love lavished upon us in Jesus Christ at Christmas. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love. What great mercy you have lavished on us. What great love you have lavished on us. Lord Jesus, I pray that you might help each of us to understand a greater measure of your love in Jesus Christ toward us. Help us to thank you and praise you all our days. Thank you, Lord. In your name do we pray. Amen.